Massachusetts has one. Florida is particularly interesting. It's a thousand dollars a day, I think, for the first 30 days to before you rectify it, and then I think it's fifty thousand up to a half a mil. You know, that's that's real money, right? So data privacy becomes much more important. Data compliance becomes much more important. And protection, as an IT person, when you thought about protection, at least in the storage space, you used to think about backup. Backup is a fraction of what protection is now. Protection is about you know, making sure your IP doesn't leak, making sure your data stays accessible, and backing up and being able to restore your data. And with all that, you have to decide the value of the data. Because not all things are created equal, so you can't really treat them equally. But as soon as you start to segregate how you're going to manage things at different levels, you've added complexity again. So we're going to have to figure out how to churn through this um, change without adding complexity. So you want everything in your infrastructure is going to have to be involved in protection. Everything's going to have to be data aware. Um, there's a, there's a, a line that I didn't create that I like to use. Ignorance is not compliance. Right? So sort of like ignorance of the law, they'll still arrest you. Ignorance is not compliant, they'll still find you. And you'll still find yourself in trouble. So you really do have to start thinking about, you know, do you start to look at things like FireEye at your firewall or some of the other stuff that's going to try to get the bad kids of guys, bad guys out. But if you looked at some of the current security stuff, unfortunately, some of the not so good guys were in. And it's harder to protect from within, right? Because there had always been a thought that as long as nobody breached from outside, you were okay and that no one was going to breach from inside. Well, that's not true anymore. We've proven that's not true anymore. So you're going to need protection at every level, applications at the analytics. Think about it. If someone got access to your analytics data, they'd know all about your business. And the cool thing is they're open to tools, so they could actually graph all about your business, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to think about all this stuff. It's all going to have to be part of your protection strategy, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. So that's the second prediction. Third one is scale. More, 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 more. I need more storage. What do you what are you storing? I don't know. More, more, more. I need more network because it's slow. You're going to have, as you start to run more and more of these cloud applications, and you start to run more of these SaaS applications, you're going to need more network connectivity, just the network in general. I don't know how many people use an outsourced email, and every once in a while it just hangs there, and if you go look at the performance monitor, you can tell why. Right? Um, you just can't get it to get it in and out of the building, no matter how much pipe you put in there at some point. So the reality is, when you've got complexity at the level it's growing, the requirement for protection that's like through the roof, and then you've got the scale we have, this is not a incremental architecture change. This is a fundamental shift we're going to have to go through, and it's going to be a few generations. So why are emerging companies, okay, so now here's another PR thing, I'm sorry. Why are emerging companies <coughs> best suited to help you with this? Well, are we smarter? Probably not. Um, but we have the luxury of looking at today's problems and what we predict the future of the problems are going to be an architect for that. Other companies had looked at, you know, 10 years ago what they thought would happen, and that's played out. So we have new technology to work with. So, for example, some of the things Equalogic didn't do that some of their competitors are doing now was because we didn't have the technology. Back in 2001, you didn't have SSDs. You couldn't get 16 gig of memory in a system, right? Now, you can have as much flash as you want. It's not cheap, but it's not as expensive as it was. It's fast enough, and so you can start to design stuff. So basically, it's saying, you know, if you were in the Stone Age of building something with a rock, you weren't going to build a, um, a skyscraper, right? Because you didn't have the tools. But as the tools grew, and the materials got better, you have the ability to build more and more um, appropriate things for going to the future. So with that, I will answer questions. Any questions? That was, yep, go ahead. Hey, Paul, what do you see as the biggest mistakes being made as people grapple, mid-market companies grapple with this incredible pressure you know, move to the cloud, move to a software-defined data center, you know, and, and, and always being pressured on budget and viewed as kind of, a, um, almost viewed by the CEO as, you know, keeping the lights on rather than a, you know, a, a competitive advantage for the business. 
Well, first of all, you're going to have to figure out how to get intelligence out of your business. So you need to be able to use your infrastructure and use your data to get intelligence. And that's not just on-prem or a private or public cloud. That's across. The other thing you have to be able to do a little bit is to step back and say, okay, there are ways to manage OpEx versus CapEx expenses. So, you know, you can have on-prem and still have it be OpEx. You can have it off-prem, definitely will be um, OpEx. So there are ways you can manage that. So don't do anything in your IT infrastructure to just manage to that. Because there are ways to do it without putting yourself at risk. And then you want to look at sort of holistically what are the, what, if things go down, what is the risk to the business and what is the resolved solution? Now potentially um, people are comforted by the, when someone says they have an outage and it was only 0.001% of the customers were affected. Me personally, if I'm that 1.00%, I'm like really mad, right? I don't care that nobody else is affected, I care about me. So you need to start to have that, um, what can I afford to have down? you know, for some amount of downtime, and what can't I have afford to have down? <coughs> what is my IP? What's being accessed all the time? What has performance versus productivity issues for performance? It's not a simple thing. I'm quoted as saying, um, if you have a misbehaving kid who's skipping school, not doing their homework, and is relatively expensive and a pain in the butt, sending them to boarding school, you know, while you won't see them for a little while, won't make them cheaper or better behave when they come home, right? So you really have to sort of get a handle on what you have and have a plan. It's not a panacea to push stuff to the cloud. It's not a panacea to have stuff on site. But what you first have to do is understand what you have, understand how you use it, understand what's important, right? So you have a lot of stuff out there that's not important and can probably move, right? But you have to know what that is, and that importance changes over time, right? We did this project. We're not doing it anymore. No one's touched it. Now we're going to bring it back. We're going to go find it. We don't know where it is, right? So you've got to have a way to holistically look at things. Any other? Again, this is a world according to Paula, right? And I'm insane. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned emerging vendors have an advantage over in the tried and true vendors that are out there. Mm -hmm. Some of those tried and true vendors have a big pocket to start innovating as well. Do you see them um, copying what the innovators are doing and catching up at some point? Or, or do, you have a, do they have a, uh, enough head start and, and flexibility to keep their market share? Oh, they'll keep their market share. What will happen will ha be is they will copy and then the next generation of innovators will go to the next thing. So I can show you right now that if I were to call out the number of people who were doing what Equalogic did, there's a lot of them. And I would tell you today I wouldn't start Equalogic, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't start that company. So I think what you'll see is you will see a repetition. So if you want to be, you know, the, on, the, on the back end of the curve, they'll start to roll it out, right? So you see people coming out with scale out, which by the way I don't necessarily think is the right thing to do anymore, although I have patents on it. Um, more about that later. You'll see people doing self-managing, which I do believe is good, but I don't think we took it far enough. Um, All-inclusive is there, although people are teetering. So I think there'll be an evolution, and so I think because in 10 years, I'm predicting the future, in 10 years we'll know the future, which will make you make another prediction. So I think we're going to a cycle. I think there's plenty of business for everybody. Any other questions? Would you care to share your take on the future of cloud computing? I know it's a big question, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that cloud computing, you know, everybody hears cloud computing and they think what? Time sharing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, IT being a commodity. Yeah. IT is not a commodity. Yeah. IT is a business partner. IT is essential to making sure that you're secure, that you're compliant, that your data has value, that your customers are serviced. And if you don't believe that in your corporation, it's just a matter of time before you go out of business, I believe. I believe IT is a critical, I think if IT guys want to be, or gals, want to be just a plug, person plugging in stuff, then they'll, they'll get there, but I don't think they are. I think they're looking for the best applications for the business. I think they're looking for the best security. I think they're getting the best value out of the data. And frankly, nobody wants to pick up the phone and call somebody in the ether to say, I'm down. They want to come see you, and they want to know you're an informed person that's going to help them get them back. So they're a trusted partner. Now on the cloud piece, so I think that it's, it's going to, unfortunately, the speed of light's been a pain in the butt for many, many years. Um, so how much data you can move back and forth. And I like the fact that VMware is going to use a truck. So they ship you a, they ship you a, um, a NAS device. <coughs> hey, we can talk about maybe having you ship a Mars. But um, <laughs> um, what the heck?
event, then you could look at the data and decide if you wanted to move it or not for the PR event. Um, but uh, I actually think that you're going to see a lot of metro clouds. So I think what's going to happen is the people you're partnering with are going to be have some on-prem, and then they're going to host for you some pieces of it. So you know the person, they know your environment, and you have a one-to-one -one relationship with them. I think that's how some of it will evolve out. And then, you know, there's the, I was on the board of a um, data sync company, so I got to see some of the Amazon bills. They were entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I think VMware is right, it's got to be predictable. It absolutely has to be predictable. So I think it's going to play out in many ways. I actually believe that, you know, it's not going to be um, one size fits all. I think it'll be on-prem. There'll be SaaS apps, obviously. And then the problem is going to be if you have 30 different interfaces to 30 different SaaS apps, I'm going to try to do the Uber app again, which would, which would be entertaining because we can try to do the Uber app for 30, well that, okay, so 30 years, so I've been doing this a long time. Right, and I, don't, I don't know that that happens. Any other questions before? Yeah, go ahead. Paul, do you see the rate of, um, you see these disruptive technologies, do you see the rate of these disruptive technologies coming at a faster pace? You looked at what you did with Equal Logic a decade ago and now this. How fast are these, how fast is this stuff changing? So I think, um, and so this is going to be self-serving, I think that the disruptive, techn the truly disruptive technologies are small. The incremental technologies are a lot. So if someone has a breakthrough idea, and then, sorry my VC friends, then everybody invests in one that does something like that, and they do incremental improvements. And they make it better, but is it 100% better? Or 1,000% better? Not really. So I think the number of companies that are truly doing something out of the box is smaller than the number of companies that have announced they have new product, right? Because I think there's a lot of incrementalism going on, um, especially in the storage space, because, okay, again, well, I won't do the, the data gravity pitch, but I do think there's some incrementalism going on. But I also think there's a lot of great innovation going on. Any other questions? I'll talk to that smartphone. He's probably out talking to the Pope. <laughs> yep. Out of some of those great innovations, what do you see as the, the, the top three um, biggest bang for the buck? Well, I'll exclude us. Um, so I really like what um, Actifio is doing. I think they're very smart about looking at kind of how your data is evolving and your, a lot of your data is basically copies. So when, especially at the high end, especially things like SaaS apps, excuse me, SAP. You know, people are still running that. SAP apps and Oracle apps. So I think what they're doing is very innovative, and I think they've created a new market, and I think in, in your case, the incumbents are claiming they're doing it, but they're not doing it yet. I think the hybrid stuff is very interesting, but I think it's, and I think there's places for it, especially in BDI. Um, I think there's other places, but obviously, you need to have something where, right now, the way it's packaged, the, you have to have something where computes and storage scale together, and there's not a lot of places where that happens, because compute is active, and unfortunately, storage is active and passive, and what's active and passive switches. And then, sort of the other thing, you'll see a bunch of folks, DR has always been a problem, and I'm not going to name a company yet, um, and also performance has always been a problem for the cloud. So you'll see some people emerging, making that easier as well. Anything else before? Yeah? Yeah? What percentage of compute uh, environments on the planet would you say are virtualized today? I think I'm going to refer to the VMware person. I would say I would say 50 to 60 percent of any meaningful apps. But anyone here from VMware? We left. I would say 50 to 60 percent. Now we may see a shift because the VMware folks aren't here. Um, we may see a shift of how they're virtualizing because containers are interesting. So I didn't bring up containers. How many people are familiar with containers and Docker and that stuff's pretty interesting, but it's it's still immature. And so I think some of the application stuff will be delivered by containers. Um, you know, how that plays out, because right now it's more of an open source Linux play, but it'll play in Windows as well. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk about how, you know, you're talking about making this data self-aware. What about the mobile problem where, where users, consumers are hitting this corporate data and pulling it out and using it on their own on their mobile Oh, so phone? data leaks. Yeah, so, um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, um, unfortunately you can't put a, RFID in your, in your data so you can signature it out, so you can watch it float after it leaves the building. Um, but when you're going to, you know, there's rights management stuff that's right now painful to use. How many people have used a rights management package? So every time you open something, it's verifying you have the right to use it. 
Okay, the reason no one's using it is because it's really painful. But a lot of that rights management stuff is going to have to get simpler and tied into who you are because you're on your phone reading the budget. You're on the phone reading what you're going to announce the S tomorrow to the stock exchange. You lose that. And it's probably not, you left your phone somewhere. You know, passwords for phones can be, they've got way, good ways to lock those down, but, you know, users can leave things open. It was always true with laptops being stolen, right? But now it's easier to lose your phone or to lose your, but there's technology that's locking that down and they're doing lockers. So there's a lot of lockers and there's multiple, they're going to run virtual machines on your phone soon and have you have a personal or private persona if they're not already doing it now. Yeah, I don't know. Companies are providing it. I don't know if users are doing it. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's what I meant. I agree with you. Companies are providing it. I don't know how many users are doing it unless their company gives them a phone with that on it. Any other questions before I? I've already run over time, so I don't want to hold back. Go in. Go in. Thank you.